you know, thanks to everybody for, for joining on, whether you're in the East Coast or the Midwest or Central Time Zone, probably, um, or Mountain Time, uh, probably had a, a typical busy urology productive day. Uh, everyone's seeing so many patients and, um, you know, we're, we're, we're really challenged to do the best we can, especially as it relates to our patients who have PSA elevation and diagnosis of prostate cancer. Um, biopsy, when to biopsy, when not to biopsy, how to move forward with treatment decision-making. And, uh, you know, as the title here suggests, um, you know, precision uh, prostate cancer pathway, that's really sort of the, the vanguard of where we are today. So many interesting therapies that are targeted towards specific gene alterations, patients with specific um, clinical parameters, uh, and patients who who may have certain molecular parameters. Um, what's also interesting is you know, it's great to see uh, you know the the model here is, is a, looks like a uh, clearly a man who's in in very who's very fit and very healthy. But it also you know brings to mind for me you know that we're we're doing so much more now in understanding uh, the diversity uh, of our populations that we take care of. Certainly in the U.S., we see so much more heterogeneity uh, in non-white populations, uh, African-American, uh, Afro-Caribbean, Afro Black, Latino, Asian-American, um, and even indigenous uh, uh, patients. So we're learning a lot. And I think that you know, one of the things that you know, many of us are getting more and more involved with is to try to understand the value proposition for a lot of these tests. And I'm gonna touch base on some of the really nice research that the folks at MDX Health have done addressing issues of diversity. Uh, and it goes without saying that diversity is also concomitant now in terms of our thought processes about precision, personalized healthcare, tailor-based healthcare, but also the economics. And I'll, I'll touch base on that a bit too. So uh, hopefully, you know, for all of us who are thinking about value-based propositions, in addition to precision-based care, how can we do better? How can we serve our patients better? How do we serve the healthcare system better? Um, I've been really fortunate. I've, I've worked with the folks in MDX now for, gosh, closing in on uh, over a decade. Um, and I really admire the way they've gone about their, their validation. We'll talk more about that. I'll talk about a lot of the different colleagues of ours in academic and in community who've been involved in that validation. Um, and so we have a patient who classically comes in, as you can see on the far left of this uh, diagram, uh, you know, they come to your office every day, your clinic every day, you know, sent in by a PCP or someone, or maybe an, uh, a work that you're doing during prostate cancer screening, they have a PSA test. What does that mean? What's normal? Is it age dependent, volume dependent? Of course it is. What's the, what's the criteria for proceeding forward to biopsy or to not biopsy? So what you see in the white boxes are the three different platforms uh, and the menu that the, the MDX health pathway in prostate cancer uh, allows you to consider. And the first is we'll talk about today, and there's really three parts to the presentation. First is on the urine-based select MDX test. And then the second part will be, and, and of course that test helps you make a decision, do I biopsy or do I not biopsy? Uh, we biopsy because we don't wanna miss clinically significant cancers. Uh, we like to avoid biopsying and that helps uh, avoid the, the morbidity and the potential complications of biopsying. And, and just the, the, the fact that, you know, I think all of us are so busy now that it's really good if we can, uh, with confidence, avoid that unnecessary interventional procedure and at least have a biomarker such as select MDX. There are clearly other biomarkers, both blood-based, urine-based imaging studies, but I'm gonna focus on the first portion tonight on the select MDX test. And um, if you basically have a, um, a negative biopsy that brings you to the top of this algorithm, uh, the use of the confirmed MDX test, which I think is really kind of 
totally unique as a uh, as a um, as a test that there's really nothing else out there that looks at this concept of surrounding molecular profiling to negative biopsy material or what some have all often called the cancerization effect. And should that be positive, uh, um, then that could lead to another a biopsy sooner rather than later, uh, and also the role for MR. If the patient has a positive finding on the biopsy, the middle of the, of the, of the, the green here in, on diagnosis, how do we stratify? Do we uh, go to an interventional treatment or an active treatment, surgical removal, radiation, brachytherapy, combinations, focal therapy? Or are we comfortable in staying with an, an active surveillance strategy, which has clearly been endorsed in our guidelines? If the patient is biopsied and found to have metastatic disease, obviously, unless the patient has a horrific performance status, that patient's going to benefit from therapy. But I'm going to focus on these white boxes that you see here on this algorithm. And, and I think that I've been incorporating these, you know, uh, routinely and for many years. So I'm, it's a pleasure to, to, to speak today. And I've been involved in the clinical studies that have led to the development of all three of these platforms. So uh, without any further ado, let's talk about select MDX. So the concept here is this kind of, you know, um, Shakespearean to biopsy or not to biopsy. Uh, in my, my, my experience, most patients have given an opportunity to hold off on having a biopsy, recognizing that there is no perfect biomarker test, but if we can have that you know, really important shared decision-making conversation, yeah, doctor, do I proceed forward to a biopsy? Um, everyone has their, their war stories. I think as we all know, whether you're doing it transrectally or, tra or transperineally, the vast overwhelming majority of our patients do pretty well, especially with good um, um, block, periprostatic blockade, a perineal block, or IV sedation or general anesthetic. But nonetheless, it's still a procedure. It uh, can risk um, uh, infection, it can risk bleeding. So how do we think about the uh, opportunities to look at uh, biobarkers? And I don't, you know, that it's it would be, you know, if I had the time, I go into all the biomarkers and all the different imaging aspects, but I'm going to focus on the select MDX. So this is a, a avoided urine sample of approximately 40 cc's. We typically like to get this after a, 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 a rectal examination. It doesn't have to be particularly rigorous. It just helps uh, shed cells, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, and I'll expand also on the biomarkers that you see listed here, the DLX1, the HOCC6. One is uh, involved in a, a, a gene that is, is a cancer progression. One is for uh, a prostate cancer cellular proliferation. And the, K, the KLK3, the calocrine family, is a reference gene. The clinical parameters, obviously very important, all known to, to us that with age, uh, the absolute PSA that's uh, being recorded, prostate volume, and whether or not there's an abnormal exam or not, typically uh, it's going to be a normal exam because I think for the most part, if you have a suspicious DRE, you're going to proceed to biopsy. And, you know, going right to the conclusion, when you get a select MDX, um, it's just avoided urine sample right after just a simple DRE, which you're invariably going to want to do, because if you pick up an abnormal DRE, you're going right to biopsy. Uh, but that said, um, and the, the, the sine qua non, or what's the true king or you know ruler of, of uh, decision-making is the NPV, the negative predictive predictive value. NPV is king um, or queen, depending upon your preference. And so uh, you, when you have a 95% negative predictive value, when you get the, a negative result telling you that the likelihood of you having a, 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 a Gleason grade group three or higher, 
that would be the Gleason score greater than seven or higher, is 95%. And a grade group four or five is 99%. This is how I simply explain it to patients and why I like this test so much. And that it's it's there's really uh, not much in the way of the economic toxicity that we see with some other tests. But let me get a little bit into the methodology. Uh, brilliant work that happened about 30 years ago in the development of uh, reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. And, and this was just an amazing event that led to the ability to take uh, you know, uh, uh, microscopic amounts of material and just amplify it in a way that was both timely and cost effective. And that's the RT-PCR, uh, allowing to create DNA from uh, RNA and ultimately uh, creating large exonal copies that let you interrogate uh, these specific gene uh, uh, findings that can lead to a decision, is, is there a likelihood of, an, of a cancer being present, let alone an aggressive cancer, uh, uh, if it's particularly there? I think most of us would agree that uh, grade group one, grade group two, predominant Gleason six or three plus fours with minimal amounts of pattern four are very good patients uh, for avoiding a potentially even to get the biopsy. But then even if you find the biopsy, and we'll talk about this more with um, uh, uh, the, uh, the third portion of our, our conversation tonight, which is the, uh, the, the Oncotype DX finding, which really helps you stratify. But sticking to the select MDX, let's get into a little bit more of a, an association or explanation for the HOC-C6 and the DLX1 and the KLK3, which is a reference gene. Without getting too much into the weeds of the, the, the basic science, uh, we know that you know, one of the markers that helps us is epithelial cell proliferation or the, the rapid proliferation of adenocarcinoma cells which is a typical hallmark of almost all neoplasias. Um, and then if you can you know, demonstrate a decrease in a cell death or classically called apoptotic effect or apoptosis, this is also consistent with normal aging. So how do we use this information to help us better define uh, um, is somebody who has a, a, a risk of having malignancy and should have a biopsy or not? Well, there's data, and clearly it was developed that an increase in the Gleason score, the aggressiveness of histopathology and, uh, uh, and TNM staging was consistent with these two gene alterations, particularly high um, HOC-C6 expression. Patients have a shorter overall survival compared to those with a lower expression. I'm going to show you um, graphs on that in a second. And it's actually one of the most upregulated up -regulated genes in the Hox gene family. You probably have also heard of Hox B13, which is uh, has a predominance in patients of um, uh, uh, who typically have Eastern European Ashkenazi Jewish um, uh, uh, um, background. I've actually found Hox B13 in, in non-Jewish patients, so probably speaks to their you know crossing over of lineage. But HOXC6 is one of the most upregulated, and it's really predominant. It can be in primary as well as increases dramatically over the, the, the progression of the biology of prostate cancer patients for, with metastatic and then going on to resistant disease. And, and here's looking at the mRNA levels. Remember, we use PCR to amplify mRNA to DNA findings and that construct. And here's the, the HOXC6. And when there's no prostate cancer present versus um, a grade group one versus greater than a grade group two. And these are, as you see, the p-values here are less than 0 0.001. So they're um, highly statistically significant. The expression goes up, the more aggressive disease, the higher the grade group score, which helps you identify who needs to be biopsied and who should not be. Likewise, the DLX1 gene expression is, uh, it has to do with an interface of epithelial and neuroendocrine differentiation. 
Um, neuroendocrine differentiation, which you oftentimes almost invariably see with small cell uh, variations, um, neuroendocrine features, but even in the more aggressive grade group threes and fours, uh, and look at this number here. In one particular study, it was virtually 99% of patients had uh, this expression compared to uh, zero of seven who did not. So it was this finding, and this was published in uh, earlier in 2016, that led to these uh, additional combinations. Here again, a highly statistically correlate of grade group two and higher versus grade group one for patients with the mRNA levels of DLX1. So I, I like this table. I'm gonna show it to you again as we move along in the personalized pathway of the, of the MDX uh, products that we're gonna talk about. Um, time doesn't allow me to go through all of these studies, but it's, it's nice to see that there really is robust evidence in select MDX. There's a lot of biomarker work that's out there there are good bl other um, blood-based biomarkers and urine-based biomarkers, but I think it's important to give credit to the fact that we have 12, if not more, published studies on the technology in over 3,000 patients. So typically, the pathway to approval is you have to demonstrate, for all of you out there who've done research, you have to show the analytic validation that your marker works. Following that is really moving into the clinical validation that it can be effective in a, a trial. Next is the clinical utility. Do clinicians, healthcare providers, frankly, urologists, um, advanced practice providers, do, do they, is this actionable information? And then lastly is really the health economics or is there economic utility? And I'm gonna show you data on all of this the analytic validation uh, published in 2017, additional uh, health economic benefit in Journal of Urology, the clinical validation, and ultimately decision-making that we published in a large study that we did in, in community. Um, this article, and I think the folks at MDX, your, your uh, medical affairs people, um, can get you copies of all of these articles. Uh, the bottom line here, you probably recognize a lot of the authors on the on a lot of these papers that I'm going to um, go just briefly go over. But bottom line, when you have a normal digital rectal exam and you basically look at the area under the curve where the high, the closer you get to one it suggests perfection. But when you have uh, in all and all uh, all patients who had, you know, basically in this particular study of nearly a thousand patients where it was documentation of normal rectal exam in, in, in more almost three quarters of the patients. And ultimately you see a sensitivity, a negative predictive value of 95%. That's really where you can take this information and say, look, Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, we just did this urine-based select MDX test. And I'm going to tell you with 95% with likelihood of being accurate, you don't have a grade group of three or higher um, a malignancy. And that's really in a nutshell how I use it. From a cost-effectiveness standpoint, and you know, I think all of us are recognizing that even though we're still in a volume-based healthcare system, we will, uh, we've been talking about moving to value-based healthcare. It's certainly much more prevalent in places such as in Kaiser Permanente and the Geisinger Clinic. Um, right now, uh, it's an area of, of constant controversy, but I do think it's fair to say it's always important to, when you can look at data, Nice paper published here. Matt Resnick has probably worked with a lot of you. You probably all a lot of you know Laura Saba and, and Tim Govers. But what's nice here is, is the bottom line is that uh, there's a cost savings here uh, that can be rather dramatic in, in avoiding unnecessary biopsies. And the likelihood of missing a significant cancer is really extremely low. So the payers like that. And, and that's why this is covered
not only by guideline repertoire, but also by my understanding, the, the vast majority uh, of, of, of commercial payers. So again, this is a 95% negative predictive value telling you whether or not there's a Gleason 7 or higher. If you have a negative test, it's 99% that you're not going to miss a grade group four or five. And those are really the patients that you feel most worried about missing. Um, it's not to say you're going to practice um, watchful uh, uh, waiting in terms of their PSA kinetics. No, you'll repeat the PSA maybe in six months or a year, uh, but you can avoid a biopsy. And, and honestly, I, I've yet to find a patient who says, uh, after getting this information, no, I want to proceed to a biopsy. It, it's, as, as we all know, uh, no one really would would like to to move forward with that. It's a rare patient who says, no, just go ahead and do it. And may, there could be examples, somebody super young and, and fit, maybe they have a worrisome family history. But even that patient, when I get a finding such as a a, a, a negative report, was, uh, you know, that somebody is very low risk, uh, with these kinds of findings, I don't proceed to biopsy. I tell the patient, well, we'll see you back. Depending upon that conversation, it could be six months to a year and we'll repeat a PSA in a digital rectal exam. But uh, the select MDX test can also help you identify the people who have cancer that need to be treated. And oftentimes these are the patients who come into your office and say, Oh, you know, every I read that Wall Street Journal article. Uh, you know, my PSA is everybody has a high PSA and everybody has cancer, and I don't want a biopsy. And of course, we all deal with that. But what we really want to do is we don't want to miss that 19% that has in this particular report that has a, a, glee, a grade group um, three or higher. And, and that's really what it's about individualizing personalizing precision-based medicine. And this is how I simply explain it to patients and, uh, and, and their caregivers or their spouses or partners who are in the room. And then with that, uh, I usually find that patients are fully understanding and they're much more comfortable moving forward to the biopsy. So um, that's the first part of our three. Then we'll talk about confirm. And then after we talk about confirm, uh, we'll we'll wrap up um, yeah, and 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 talk about you know the 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 oncotype DX or what's sometimes called the the GPS score and I actually like the GPS score the uh, gen genomic prostate score but let me just stop for a second and happy to answer any questions or if anybody has something they want to put into the chat about uh, select MDX. Got some cases at the end too, which I'll pop up, but not, not seeing any questions. Um, let me uh, switch over now to the second platform on this personalized approach. We talked about select, the patient who comes in. Oh, there's a there's a there's a chat question. So let's see if One I can... just popped up for you, Dr. Shore. Can you see it? Yep, I do. I see it from Dr. Muhammad. Thank you, sir. And um, it says, I use MRI with MDX. What do you think about that? You know what? I, I like that approach. Um, you know, for the longest time, I was not getting routine MRs, but now that we have, you know, pretty full coverage on uh, CMS, uh, if the patient doesn't have uh, metal in their body, doesn't have a hip prosthesis, doesn't have a pacemaker that doesn't allow some of the newer pacemakers, they can be MR friendly, but, let, but pa patients have hardware hip prosthesis, spinal hardware, or a pacemaker, I don't typically get it. But for my Medicare patients, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty routinely getting the MR, Dr. Muhammad, and I love correlating it with this select MDX. I explain to patients uh, that, you know, I can take a, 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 a potpourri, not really a potpourri, but really a menu of biomarkers, we can call an MR an imaging biomarker in conjunction with SELECT, and I like it very much in conjunction with total PSA, possibly a, a total with a free PSA, or even something like a PHI score. I use that the, those two, three fairly routinely to help inform patients should we proceed to biopsy or not. So thank you for the question. <clears throat> 
So, so I'm sorry to interrupt. There, they, there are a couple more that popped up. Um, the next question um, from looks like Dr. Diva: Does finasteride use affect results of select MDX? So, great question. Um, finasteride use um, should not affect the results of select MDX. It clearly should affect the results of your PSA. Um, and so, uh, ideally, I think there, there's some additional data that's been reported on that, but I'm not aware that um, a 5-ARI inhibitor such as finasteride or dutasteride should have an effect on uh, either uh, DLX or, or HOXI-6 expression. I think Dr. Muhammad had a follow-up here. So if I have a real young guy, uh, you know, we can define real young guy, I'll say, is anybody under 65? Uh, I say that as I'm getting, you know, closer and closer to that number. Um, so if I have a real young guy, just kidding, but let's say he's 50 and no family history, PSA, the three to five, I'll get both MR and, and select MDX. If either, either or both show suspicion, I'll tell him to do a biopsy. I don't think that's unreasonable. Certainly, if you have a PIRADS four or five and your select is negative or your select is positive and you only have PIRADS three, or you could be just PIRADS two, let's face it, MR has about a 20% false positive, false negative rate, which is why I think combining a select is a really nice way to go. Inexpensive, covered, simple to get. I like that. And I find that patients find it uh, very um, user-friendly to them rather than they come in and I say, oh no, we're just going right to biopsy because you know your PSA is X. Because as we all know, there can be some vicissitudes of PSA. Um, clearly, if there's an abnormal DRE that's blatantly abnormal and, and we all know what that is, I go straight, I go to biopsy regardless of the PSA. All right, so um, detecting clinically significant cancers. Uh, unfortunately, we can have upwards of a, a miss of about 25% of patients when we do a biopsy. And, uh, you know, I think we all experience the patient who says, oh, you biopsy me, I'm negative. That means I don't have cancer. And you'd like to say, well, based on the biopsy, the, that's correct. You don't have cancer, but I could have missed it because we typically do in our, our biopsying and everybody does a little bit differently. You may only take 10 cores or 12 cores. You may take 25 or 30 cores. But um, as a general rule of thumb, the biopsy on a 30 to 40 plus gram gland is only about 1% of the actual prostate gland volume or PGV. Um, and of course, prostate uh, malignancies can be multifocal. They can be unifocal. They can be multifocal and they can be heterogeneous. And that's sort of the buzzword we always talk about with prostate cancer, the marked heterogeneity. So there is that number of about a 25% false negative rate. And that's really been borne out by multiple meta-analyses. Um, and if you, if, if you do a repeat biopsy, um, you may find upwards of 50% of, of, of those repeat biopsies, you may find a clinically significant cancer. So how can you augment the biopsy? Because um, invariably, when the patient comes back to review the results, you know, probably the first question we all ask is, oh, how'd you do? Any problems after you went home? And fortunately, most say not really. They have blood in the ejaculate, blood in, when they urinate. Some have perineal discomfort. There's the occasional patient who says, my erections aren't any better or um, having voiding symptoms. And we do see 1% who can get septic and 1% who will get significant um, a bleeding. So, um, you know, how to, and, and, and say you're still concerned, you know, they've got good performance status. They're younger. Maybe there's family history of malignancy. The patient has a lot of anxiety, but doesn't want another biopsy. So how do you get the most out of it? And I think that's a kind of a good header or title to this slide. Um, and here's a young looking patient here on the far left. He's got a, a negative biopsy and he says, yeah, okay, I hated the procedure, Dr. Shore. I was miserable. I don't wanna do that again, but yet I'm young and I'm worried that I may have a cancer. So what are we gonna do to ensure that I'm getting closer to that AUC of 100% 
uh, that I don't have malignancy or that ROC, the receiver operating curve. And so the, the, you can you know, do repeat um, uh, PSAs, uh, of course. Um, and then um, ultimately you can do the repeat DRE, you can do an MR, you lead to the biopsy. And what the confirm MDX shows, and I said that, talked about this earlier, is the brilliance of it is there's nothing else on the market like it. It really is standalone. And that's why it's included in both NCCN and EAU guidelines. So you're going to essentially take the slides, as I described to patients, we're not rebiopsying you. And then they give that sort of woof sigh of relief. Uh, we're going to take your slides and we're going to send them off for what's called a confirm MDX. And what, what exactly does that mean? So um, essentially, there's this notion around methylation, and there's the methyl group, the CH3, and there are epigenetic changes that occur throughout all cancers, and epigenetic findings is a fascinating area of research. Uh, methylation uh, occurs prior to the development of most cancers, and if the genes are methylated, they're sort of, they're turned off or they're silenced, and, uh, and then they're there we normally have a whole cadre of tumor suppressor genes, but if they're turned off, then the, the gene expression allows for tumor development. So it's been well described. And again, I, you know, it gets pretty, you know, um, heady and into the details of the science. It's pretty fun stuff to read if you like it, but the, the GST uh, Pi 1, uh, which is down there, you see the, the name for it. Uh, really be beautiful work by Carducci and others. Uh, and it's found in up to 90% of prostate cancers in an elevated form. Um, it's a detoxifying agent in terms of preventing genomic damage. So these, um, um, these CPGs or the CPG islands of hypermethylation really prominently um, um, demonstrated with GSTP1. It's the most common somatic genome, somatic meaning tumor, not germline, not inherited, but somatic tumor alteration described in prostate cancer. And this was really some you know, brilliant work that's published in American Journal of Pathology uh, over 20 years ago now. So it was that finding of and understanding these tumor this tumor suppressor gene, the G GSTP1, and then APC. Now, the APC has to do with an uh, apoptotic effect and cellular proliferation, and that results in the speed and the regularity of cellular division. And when it's silenced, it's also associated with neoplasia or another or tumor genesis or production of, of tumor growth. Um, RAS-F1 is associated with cell cycle progression and also with apoptosis. The most powerful one of these three is probably the GSTP1, but when you add them together and you get all three of them demonstrating methylation, it's particularly compelling that you could have missed an area of what was described back in the 50s the area surrounding the negative tissue as cancerization or a halo effect. Because let's face it, we're only as good as where that needle goes in and pulls out the core of 1% of the total gland volume. So GSTP1 is found in up to 90% of prostate cancers. Uh, and these are the other, uh, uh, the ACTB is a reference gene to making sure we look across as a baseline subset. So this is a good example. There's the cancer and there's the various uh, halo effects. Some early work was really nicely published on this by Eric Klein at Cleveland Clinic. There's a very nice paper that came out in 2011 in, in Nature Reviews Cancer, which is a very high impact journal. But essentially when you look at this cartoon, you see the tumor and ultimately you can see what was described the, progression in the related field, secondary fields, uh, progression independent of the field. And this is this concept then of cancerization or a halo effect. Doesn't require any additional intervention. 
One just simply takes the slides, sends them off. Very easily accomplished. And typically the turnaround time of getting the results is about 10 days once the, the, the product is in-house at, uh, at uh, for the folks at MDX. Now I talked about on Select MDX, how we do this validation pathway very similarly here. You have to have, um, you know, analytic validation. Now, you know, it probably should be more bold. 55 published studies in peer-reviewed journals, over 5,000 patients that ultimately this led to the, uh, the analytic validation that indeed this worked. And then you do the clinical validation. Fabulous work by our good friend and colleague, Alan Parton at Johns Hopkins. Alan, unfortunately, is, is really fighting for his life. He's got, you know, really difficulties right now. And I don't know if any of you know Alan, but he's a fabulous guy. He's at Johns Hopkins, and he's really kind of in for the fight of his life uh, for um, his health. Um, and, and he's been pretty public about it. So I'm not, you know, betraying any confidences. But he did the pioneering work at Johns Hopkins that led to the clinical validation um, and the, ultimately the negative predictive value, when you get a negative response, uh, when you send off the slides, you send off the archival tissue of your recent biopsy, and it's validated out to a year. That's pretty cool. You can basically do out, all the way out to a year. I think I'm correct. I might be wrong because some of from the folks listening, I, maybe even longer than a year, but that's pretty good when you can go back. If somebody shows up at your clinic it's shore biopsy to now they're in your clinic in Ohio and you can potentially send off for a confirmed EX. And then uh, uh, Bob Waterhouse, good friend who was at Charlotte Urology for a very long time at, at, at CUP. Uh, he did a really a beautiful study on uh, demonstrating the validation in African-American patients. And then Kurt Wino, who's really one of the you know premier uh, community-based urologists in the U, a pathologist. I'm sorry, pathologist. He was at Michigan for the longest time. Did a clinical utility and actionality actionability paper that ultimately was published as well. And here are these papers. Um, the risk score predicts high-grade prostate cancer in DNA methylation positive. So if you all your methylation markers, the RAS F. F51, the APC, the DTSP1, if they're negative, you're great. But if you're positive, then this was the paper that led. And you can see the ROC curve at the bottom demonstrating the, the validation for the confirmed test. Of course, we can get you this paper if you want to read it, uh, which I would recommend you, you, you do. Here's some additional work that the risk score predicts the possibility the likelihood of having a high-grade cancer when there's DNA methylation positivity in the setting of histopathologically negative biopsies, in particular, uh, grade group, Gleason score seven and higher. So there you see, in, in conjunction with clinical risk factors, when you have a positive test, this really dramatically in a population that was studied at 800 patients really tells you when you're not just looking at age and not, or if you only were doing looking at age only looking at a prior bias positive biop uh, a prior biopsy or not biopsy PSAs or atypia when you have the methylation confirmation look at the odds ratio how it goes up literally sevenfold to 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 12 fold which is quite quite dramatic and then the clinical validation uh, that was uh, subsequently uh, published by Bob Waterhouse, an African-American cohort of over 200 men, I think is really important. Again, we're do looking at more and more Kelvin Moses is on this. Uh, you know, many of, of you are probably may, may have participated in this. I see Bron Tutrone, other colleagues of ours, V. Schiffman in Houston, uh, Myron Murdoch from Maryland. So a lot of good names on here and good colleagues who are very involved in studies like this. And of course, this important notion about um, disparity um, uh, and inequity, and, and we want it to have you know, uh, equipoise for uh, all of our patient populations. And as, as the US continues to diversify, it's good to see, because most of our studies still 
uh, whether they're therapeutic or biomarker driven, diagnostic, imaging, still tend largely to be predominantly in white populations. And I think it's a very, very important effort that all of our guidelines and all of our associations and, and all of uh, uh, device companies and biopharma is moving towards in, in greater inclusion, which is, which is great. And this has been done here for confirmed DX. So if you have a positive result, you get your individual score and the score basically says, okay, Maybe now I get an MRI, maybe I go to a repeat biopsy. And I think this is just, again, giving a really nice opportunity to personalize healthcare. Be, be that, you know, that vaunted and important patient-physician shared decision-making. Here's a patient who has positive across th the three methylation markers. And what's really cool, it's, I'm sorry, it's small print here, but it's saying, you know, um, left mid. So, so not only does it tell you kind of where to go, um, but it also um, tells you that you have the, these three marker positives. So that tells you that you have a 12% risk of, of, of identifying a, a Gleason 7 or higher and could potentially help you with a repeat biopsy and really go to your region of interest and focus in on that lead left mid zone. And that's how I explained it to patients. I show them the report. They seemingly always get it. If you're DNA methylation negative, I say, this is fantastic news. And I've kind of dropped you down from missing 25% of patients. Um, uh, I can do this conversation via telehealth or in the clinic. But now I say, look, you have a negative report. You're 96% negative predictive value and a 90% of any form of cancer. So that would be more likely the, the inclusive of the grade group ones and twos. And then it makes me and the patient, I think a lot more comfortable in saying, okay, great. Um, let's check a PSA, maybe in six months, maybe a year. Uh, and we certainly don't have to proceed forward with another biopsy. If you look at some papers and some guidelines, and that's always the big risk. When do I bring a patient back? If I feel that their PSA is at is high or their doubling time was concerning relative to their age and their gland volume. So that's basically how I've been using it. Uh, I get it routinely in all of my negative biopsies. I really like it. It's reassuring to patients. I'll see them back in a telehealth or in clinic. And then I have the opportunity if it's positive, I it may just follow them more closely with PSA and DRE typically would get an MRI if I hadn't got one already and might even go right to an earlier biopsy within a six month time frame, especially if there was a lot of methylation positivity. And that's how I've been successfully using it. So um, let me stop there and talk about, um, you know, answer any questions uh, regarding um, you know, confirmed EX been out for gosh, cl closing in on like, almost 10 years, I believe, or, or close to it. Um, any questions on that before we go to the GPS or the genomic prostate score? Looks like we got one question. <clears throat> How far out from cancer does the methylation occur? That's a great question. Um, you know, I don't have a really ideal answer for that. I've seen various papers on that that, you know, suggest it could be, you know, um, within, uh, you know, a millimeter to more than a millimeter to, to, to you, know, you know, two, three millimeters out. I think there, it, it, it clearly, if you're, uh, you know, going way far out, I think there's, there were some really nice papers on this and that there, the reference is escaping me. But it's a zone of cancerization that overlaps, right? It's sort of, think of it sort of like a Venn diagram, because if you've done your 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 twelve to twenty core biopsy, you theoretically map the prostate, you know, the anterior, the lateral, the medial, you know, um, a base to apex, and so that you're you're trying to do a Venn diagram of overlapping with your biopsies, and so therefore you should be getting a pretty good overlap in, in sort of a, that overlapping concentric uh, aspect for the methylation as well. 
All right, so let me go into uh, GPS. Uh, I think uh, I congratulate the folks at MDX. I started working on the, the you know, uh, GPS back in the day when it was uh, being developed by Genomic Health and Eric Klein was at Cleveland Clinic. And it was really, he, we did a lot of work together on this. Uh, in addition to the folks out at UCSF and Peter Carroll, and then uh, Genomic Health uh, um, uh, uh, was acquired by Exact Science. And now I'm really thrilled that MDX has brought it into their portfolio. Uh, I think it's fantastic. I mean, it really allows to have that really cool first slide, uh, which I can just kind of go back to for a second. It really gives you this sort of powerhouse for having um, a, a full a comprehensive menu uh, and, and, a, and a precision uh, approach to how you would think about uh, your patients with uh, uh, to a HUDA biopsy. And then if it's negative, to confirm that you, you, you've done the adequate sampling. But now when you get to the GPS, you've got a diagnosis of prostate cancer. We have this ongoing controversy, you know, do I do a prostatectomy? Do I perform uh, external beam radiation? Do I perform focal therapy? Do I perform brachytherapy? Or do I do active surveillance? Um, you know, genetics and genomics. Uh, genetics, the study of hereditary traits and organisms it can vary. There's a genetics or gene alterations that come inherited from your parents, the, the, the um, egg, the ova, and, and the sperm. Um, those are described as germline or hereditary. And then there are somatic alterations or tumor, tumorigenic alterations that happen. Uh, and so uh, you can see these definitions here. I know you're all you know, familiar with it. Um, there are coding and non-coding DNA with the various epigenetic factors, uh, but the genome encompasses the complete genetic information of an organism, whole genome sequencing, as opposed to doing panels or hotspots. Um, so some other definitions um, we talked about, I just mentioned a second ago, issues of germline that are inherited. Um, and we find that about 5% uh, uh, of patients in the population have gene alterations. About 10 to 12% will have gene alterations with who are newly diagnosed, especially those with metastatic cancer. And by the time you have resistant disease, upwards resistant prostate cancer, upwards of 30, 25% of patients will have gene alterations coming from the tumor. Um, there's a great excuse me, there's a greater risk of developing cancer over our lifetimes. And that has to do with, you know, the immunobiology of our immune system and environmental and genetic exposures. Um, the somatic sequencing, as you can see here, can be obtained through tissue or, or blood-based. But cancer is ultimately a disease of the genome. Um, we see various ways that we have gene expression. So if you have an abnormal gene expression, um, particularly um, the, as that increases, that has, there's really excellent data, and we'll go over this, that increases the likelihood that you would have worsening pathology or an upgrading of your histopathology that was only limited to your biopsy that showed cancer. Uh, other factors that can also be involved is the likelihood is, as those genomic alterations increase, the likelihood of failure of a primary therapy, so BCR, biochemical relapse, more likelihood of nodal metastases and metastases in general. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive. We do a here are the factors that we look at, both lab and clinical. Well, of course, an abnormal DRE, it is subjective. Um, you know, I, you know, we, we, we try to, uh, for all of us who have medical students or residents come work coming through our clinics, um, you know, is trying to teach, you know, what's normal, what's abnormal. And there is subjectivity and there is variability. We all know this. We have it even amongst our peers as clinicians who are seasoned uh, with doing thousands of rectal examinations. Some are blatantly obvious and some are just more subtle. 
Um, elevated PSA, again, related to vol gland volume, related to age. Was there any sort of trauma, whether there's sexual experience or um, uh, excessive, you know, a bicycle riding or other sort of perineal um, um, traumas? Uh, and the use of 5-ARI, whether it's been uh, used regularly or every or not well recorded, but of course, 5-ARI will, as general comment, reduce upwards to 50% of the PSA um, uh, amplitude. MRI, again, also not a perfect test, 20 to 25% false positives, false negatives. The PIRADS-3 is a considered intermediate lesion, ones and twos, benign, fours and fives, highly consistent with a significant malignancy. And then of course the, 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 the um, operator or the interpreter variation, we see this in MR, we're now seeing this in PSMA PET scans as well. Uh, perhaps with artificial intelligence, that'll be improved, but that's a separate topic. And then the issue about biopsying, you know, do we adequately sample? And of course, the same operator variability we see with radiology and MR, we can see with pathologists as well. I'm sure we've all on this call have had that experience where someone called something ASAP or Gleason 6, and another pathologist said, oh no, that's a, that's a Gleason 8. Uh, or even that Gleason 6 didn't even call it cancer. So there are variations and thus, the importance of getting additional information. Um, you know, under sampling, um, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing issue. Some of us will may be comfortable doing 12 core biopsies routinely. Some may be comfortable only doing, you know, 24 cores. It's a bit all over the place, but you know, at the end of the day, I think the standard um, biopsy should be at a minimum 10 to 12. Um, there is now a greater movement away from transrectal to transperineal. Transrectal is still certainly acceptable. Transperineal, I think, gives you a little bit better tissue sampling because you're parallel to the prostate gland. And data is pretty convincing that it cuts down on the infection risk. You do have to be comfortable in doing a transperineal block and, you, and or have I either you know, anesthetic with IV sedation or general anesthetic. And that depends upon your setup, if you're doing it in your clinic or an ambulatory surgery setting. Um, biologic undersampling, that's where, because we know that biopsy is not perfect and we may not be getting uh, the, uh, we, may, we, we may have missed a Gleason eight or nine and only captured the six or seven. There may be variation in the interpretation by the pathologist. So I think getting the GPS, uh, the genomic prostate score, gives us another tool, another stratifying event that allows us to say to the patient, your cancer on a gray, on a, based upon the International Society of Europathology, which I like to use, the Gleason gray group, one, two, three, four, five, I can better help understand if you're more likely going to be a less aggressive to a, a more aggressive a, a patient based upon the data that I'm going to review right now. So um, biopsies can often miss adverse pathology. And so this really nice paper that was published uh, in, in Journal of Urology, first um, by Eric Klein in European Urology, 2014, seems like a long time ago, but I remember when this came out, this was a really important paper, it still is, but uh, looking at patients who had um, either uh, a Gleason 6 versus a Gleason, three Gleason 7, 3 plus 4, um, the likelihood of finding adverse pathology, and you can see it increases to be non-organ confined, especially and an histopathologic upgrade to 4 plus 3, and you see the differences between the gray group one versus the gray group two. It's pretty pretty significant. You see adverse pathology going up to, from 3.3 to 12.3%, non-organ confined, six to 17%. So that's of a real significance just on looking at biopsies and subsequent radical prostatectomy findings. So how do, can we better get insight into who those patients are? 
So the, the beauty of the work that was done was looking at all of these huge um, uh, uh, cassettes of specific genes, trying to cull down what were the most significant genes. So there's an enormous amount of work that went into this, looking at over 700 prostate-specific candidate genes and going down with whole mouth prostates, an enormous amount of effort in assessing down to 288 and coming down to these 17 genes for the analytical performance. And this gives uh, the expression in samples as small as uh, literally uh, 0.5 uh, millimeter. Uh, and th this is really quite a re remarkable thing, I have to say. I mean, um, you know, <clears throat> we oftentimes, you know, just think that, you know, these things happen with, uh, you know, uh, something comes to, to, to validation. Talk about getting uh, analytic validation and then clinical validation. This was a tremendous amount of work and effort by pathologists, by preclinical basic scientists, and by um, uh, urologists, both prostatectomists and biopsying. And ultimately, we see these four pathways for these 17 genes, androgen signaling, cellular organization, stromal response, and cellular proliferation. Um, so I think it's important to note here that um, these, these genes are representative of these very important predictive biologic pathways. By combining them, these four pathways, they become more predictive than any single pathway. And that's an important take home point and further you know, explains the validation of the test. These um, Kaplan-Meier style curves that I remember were first reported at SUO, uh, the Society of Urologic Oncology demonstrated that the, the GPS was an independent predictor for the risk of BCR metastasis, and prostate cancer-specific death. I mean, that's really was very powerful information, and it was validated to predict adverse pathology, so essentially positive margin or seminal vesicle invasion. And you can see uh, the curves going from left to right, uh, depending upon the score, the, you know, the, the higher the score, the more likely if you'd go from being very low to low to intermediate to high risk. And uh, so as we know, if you have adverse pathology at a radical prostatectomy, this is a lot high likelihood that you're ultimately going to go on and you're going to fail from the prostatectomy uh, and even potentially with adjuvant uh, radiation therapy. Um, and that you have a higher likelihood, as you can see on the graphs, um, looking at the purple graph versus the gray graphs, looking, and that really tells you that the likelihood of the score, the higher the score, uh, which be consistent with those purple dotted bars, to likely to have adverse pathology. The adverse pathology in the y-axis on the left tells you about you know, the likelihood of developing metastasis, which then leads to the whole cascade of additional therapies for metastatic disease, and then ultimately the risk of, of prostate-specific mortality. Now, the good news is this is done in years, and so the likelihood of dying is really pushed off, but the risk of metastasis basically gives you that sort of binary discussion with the patient. I'm really comfortable in sitting tight and doing active surveillance, or given your age, given your actuarial survival, we really should treat you. And thus the real genius behind the genomic prostate score. Uh, and then it, the, it, what you see here in the green rectangular box, a cohort is representative of active surveillance candidates population. The low risk and the, and the, and the, the intermediate were based on AUA classification. So uh, again, you, you see this uh, you know, graph over here with the confidence intervals. The GPS assay is associated with 20-year outcomes for distant metastasis and prostate cancer-specific mortality in AUA low and intermediate risk patients. So you're able to take these models which have been validated, which have made it into the guidelines to assist patients in saying, 
well, how do we think about this and making a decision about surveillance versus intervention? So additional work that, that subsequently was published again by Cullen and, and all in uh, uh, the following year, 2015 in European Urology, ultimately showed here that and with a with a five year follow up that in a in a really nice representation of African Americans twenty percent of the population uh, the really strong correlation that with the higher GPS score the higher the likelihood that you would demonstrate um, uh, 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 likelihood for adverse pathology which subsequently correlates with distant metastases and a prostate cancer specific mortality. So this is sort of kind of putting it all together. Again, you have a biopsy, you find cancer. How do you further risk stratify with the patient in making the decision? Do I go to surveillance or do I go to an intervention? And that's really the, the genius of it. If you convert this now to patients who have very low low or favorable intermediate, so the grade group ones, twos, uh, by NCCN criteria, and you get a GPS result between zero and 100, this is how you get to decide, or not to decide, but the patient ultimately decides, but you have the discussion to help make an understanding of, do I proceed to surveillance or do I go to an active treatment? And I think this is a really an important slide here. Matt Cooperberg published this in JAMA. Uh, others have published similar results. Mark Delara, uh, Del Delara is in Texas. Dave Albala in Syracuse. Ben Lowentritt presented this at Lugpa in 2017 from uh, Chesapeake Urology. But what you're seeing here, Greg, you're at Urology of Virginia, is that by <clears throat> using the GPS, you see a versus no GPS in the dark gray green bar. The light green is the GPS. You see uh, a marked increase in your patients to go on to active surveillance. Uh, and, and this is, you know, the type of thing that, you know, we got into a lot of controversy over back in 2000, right? Was the USPSTF was saying, don't do any more screening because everybody getting a diagnosis of cancer was getting rushed off to a prostatectomy or radiation. And we recognize that the histopathology is not perfect. And that's why with the GPS score, um, you can further help delineate those patients who have a, the, 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 the low risk, the very low risk, the favorable intermediate say, you know what, something's not right. Your GPS score is really high. Or, or guess what, your GPS score is really low, you are really well suited for surveillance or you're better suited based upon your performance status, your actuarial survival and a high GPS score, uh, I think we should be considering interventional treatment, so surgery or radiation. But it, ultimately it's giving you that sort of broad breadth of conversation to make what's personalized healthcare decision, which is the kind of theme of this talk. So you'll get these reports and you'll see, um, uh, you know, whether you, you'll see a score here that says, hey, your GPS is 12. What does that mean, doctor? Well, you have a low likelihood versus a moderate versus a high likelihood of having adverse pathology. So in, the, in this particular example here for this patient, um, the, the GPS score of 12 has the likelihood that they could have high grade disease a grade group three or higher, 12%, not organ confined, 10%. I immediately tell the patients, so there's an 88% chance that you don't have higher grade, higher grade disease. If we did a prostatectomy, there's a 90% chance that you're organ confined. And the likelihood of you having met metastatic disease is 4% in 10 years. Uh, and the likelihood of you dying of cancer uh, is less than 1%. We're still going to follow you, and you can still end up, uh, you know, having in a small percentage of cases uh, uh, increase in your in your histopathology, and then we could still treat you. And I, I find that this is enormously helpful for patients 
because let's face it, they get the diagnosis of cancer, they hear the C word, and many patients walk out of the office and the proverbial comment is they feel like their, their hair's on fire, but indeed they're not. And this is giving them that additional piece of information to make a, uh, an appropriate decision. And so here is uh, another example of uh, a low GPS score, which would help you uh, and better inform a patient who has a, here in this particular case, their PSA is five, they have a normal digital rectal exam. Um, this patient, you know, so he was born in 1965, so he's still relatively young. I use this in my patients even in their 50s. I, I'm, I am comfortable in doing active surveillance in patients in their 50s, explaining to them that over time that there's a, with time, there may be um, change in the biology of the cancer, but if I can give them 10, 15 years where I'm not going to upset their urinary or their, or their uh, sexual function, and I'm still going to follow them and may do, you know, repeat biopsy, may do uh, repeat MR, not may, assuredly I will in any kind of an active surveillance program, but, uh, and I explain that to the patient. But, you know, it's very interesting. I, I, I see still many patients who are like, you know what, um, you know, take my prostate out or radiate me. But that's just me. But at, at least at the, very, at the very minimal, you've had an opportunity to further create this sort of personalized precision-based care with your patient. And they can't say, well, geez, that Dr. Shore, he just rushed me off to surgery or to radiation, but gave me some options. So, um, so it basically, this is sort of a build slide that's the likelihood of high grade disease, non organ confined, likelihood of metastasis, likelihood of dying of a prostate cancer specific death uh, at the end of 10 years. And I go through each one of these parameters and explain it to the patient, just, just like that, frankly. So, um, I've got a little bit of time here. Let me run through a few cases. I totally want to be respectful of everybody. We started at seven. We're a little over an hour. We'll try to get this, you know, wrapped up. There, these are some pretty cool cases. Won't go into them in extreme detail, but they're kind of fun to see because they, we see cases like this every day, all of us who take care of patients with prostate cancer. So here's um, a 62-year-old white male. He's got a family history of prostate cancer, family history of breast cancer. Um, germline testing is done and it's HOXB13, which HOXB13 is not a homologous recombinant repair alteration, but it does have a very high likelihood of cancer. And it also oftentimes has a more aggressive cancer associated with it. He's, so he's a youngish guy. He's, he's, he's biopsy, he's Gleason 6. PSA is high on the 9.5. He's a normal exam. Seven cores positive out of 15. Um, and there's three, uh, he's got a, a pyrads three and, and a region of interest, it looks like. Um, and so um, uh, a, a, a GPS is obtained. And uh, here the patient is found. I think this will build, there we go, it's a build. So he's a 32. So maybe this guy was saying, you know what, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't, you know, no, everybody dies of prostate cancer. I don't want to get treated. And then he doesn't really buy into the HOXB13 thing you explained to him, or maybe you didn't get that genetic test, but then you just simply get the GPS score because you're, you're, you, all you have to do is um, send the slides, easy to do. It's not additional um, biopsying. It's the material you already have. The turnaround's about a week to 10 days. And so the combination of this patient's clinical features and gives him a score of 30, and his, and his 32 score says he has a nearly 20% likelihood of having a higher grade disease and a 24 or one in four likelihood of non-organ confined or a PT3. So uh, the physician's post-GPS uh, assay recommendation is to go to prostatectomy, whereas earlier it was, okay, you know, uh, we just saw Gleason 6, it's gray group one, we're going to go with active surveillance. 
Maybe the patient was leaning towards it, but now you have this GPS score, which says, you know what, I think you're, you're, here's what your risks are of high grade disease of non-organ confinement. And this patient went on to have a, a, a prostatectomy and was a, a PT2. Fortunately, nodes were negative. Here's another case, little older gentleman, 66, African-American, has a biopsy for a PSA of 4.5, normal exam, Gleason score six, um, three out of 12 cores positive, greater than 50% tumor involvement, no. Thinking, okay, we're gonna do active surveillance, but you know what, maybe his daughter or son is in there and saying, oh no, you know, I." You got to take it out. I know a guy who died of prostate cancer. He needs to be treated, radiate him. So then you get the GPS score and it's a little on the high side. Just like the last case, his high grade disease risk 20%, non organ confined 26%. But all right, so now it, differently here, rather than the patient who said, I don't want to do anything, and the Maybe the family members were like, yeah, you got to do something, children, because they want dad to be around forever. But instead now, the, the, the decision was to go with a, a post-GPS assay. Um, let's just follow you more closely. And maybe that allows for reassurance to the family and the probably less so the patient in this scenario that I'm painting, but more so to his children. We're not going to ignore it. We're going to check your PSA. Maybe we'll follow up with an MRI and then we'll follow up with a biopsy sooner rather than later. But at least this gives us additional um, metric to review. So here's another case, younger person, younger man, 54, family history positive, least than six, PSA seven, high for a 54 year old, six out of 15 cores positive, but still by definition, he is low risk NCCN. MRI shows a PIRADS four. Um, given that he's grade group one, physician says, you know what? I've read the literature. I think we can go ahead. Your NCCN says you're grade group four, you're, you're, you're low risk. Let's just keep an eye on you. And then we get the GPS score and lo and behold, it's 42. It's basically saying there's something else going on here based upon those 17 genes, the four different pathways that we looked at. And look, a, 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 a almost a 40% likelihood of non-organ confined disease. So the post GPS recommendation is now for surgery and the patient is, is, a, is a PT3A. Well, what about somebody who had favorable intermediate risk? Here's a 73 year old, so he's slightly older uh, than our last few cases. High PSA of 19.5, one out of 15 cores positive. And it's uh, it's favorable intermediate by the, because of the higher PSA, not because of the histopathology. And pre-GPS, the physician says, let's just watch you. And then we get the, the then, but again, maybe the, the, the patient's anxious, the, the partner's anxious, um, the children are anxious. Maybe you had a friend who died of prostate cancer, and now you get the, the, the post-GPS score, and it should give you the reassurance that there's a 82% uh, likelihood of having low-grade disease and it, uh, uh, an 81% of it being organ confined. And so you can go with a, an active surveillance and reassure the patient. Uh, and this was this patient's GPS of 25. Uh, and this is how I explain it to patients and uh, that their risk of a uh, 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 prostate cancer death at 73 is, is 1%. Uh, when patients hear those numbers, I think they go, okay, I get that. And I, and I said, we're going to continue to follow you. There's always a small risk that you could have evolution of your biology, but we're going to keep an eye on you. So here's another case, 67, Gleason 3 plus 4, grade group 2, 6.4 PSA, 8 of 19 cores positive, 
physician says, okay, let's assume we're going to do focal therapy because everything was on the left side of the gland. We're going to do a left gland hemiablation, um, but get the GPS score and bam, it's, it's higher than we had expected. It's a 33. And so the risk of adverse pathology is 51%. Um, and the 10-year likelihood of metastasis is 7%. And this informed the patient to say, you know what, uh, I'm not going to do the folk, or the physician maybe said, you yeah, know, focal therapy may not be the in the cards here. Let's go ahead. Let's do surgery. You're in good health. You have good actuarial survival. So and let's proceed to prostatectomy. So these are just examples of how you can use the information um, I think they're pretty good real world potentials. Um, 64 year old, Gleason 6, um, PSA 11.4, um, that and a, and a normal exam, three out of 12 cores. He's favorable intermediate by the NCCN risk because the PSA was above 10. Uh, the pre GPS is saying uh, with the conversation, physician shared decision making, let's do active surveillance. But bam, look at that GPS of 47. And you can see the per, uh, risk of adverse pathology of 68%. Um, I've had these cases. And if you've used the, the, the GPS, you'll see them. Um, more times than not, I find the GPS is really confirmatory and telling me to just helps me convince, not convince, maybe that's not the best word, but um, encourage, uh, assuage patients of their anxiety over their cancer, that active surveillance is good. But then I do have these cases, I've had many of them where it says, you know what, surveillance is not going to be good for you, especially in our younger patients who would benefit from prostatectomy. And some of our older patients who you might not want to take their prostates out, but you would consider radiation therapy. Uh, and then let's look at some unfavorable and high risk, um, uh, unfavorable intermediate and high risk, because the indication for GPS has been expanded. Um, and this can further stratify what you see here, patients. This is an, a, a, a nice uh, article that um, uh, uh, looked at. Um, in 2020, it was published and looking at uh, BCR, biochemical, refre biochemical recurrence free survival, in a couple of hundred patients at Kaiser Permanente. Um, these were all patients who'd had radical prostatectomy. Uh, and essentially, these KM curves are showing you that it, you know, that less than or equal to 40, your, B, your BCR likelihood was that resembling that of a, a favorable intermediate, um, while the, un, uh, uh, the unfavorable intermediate risk group with a higher than 40 had a, a more of a, of a correlation with patients who had high risk disease. That's really the take home here. So that can inform you regarding doing additional adjuvant therapies. Um, this is a busy slide, but in patients with unfavorable intermediate risk, the GPS is a good predictor of BCR, distant metastasis, and prostate cancer death, and looking at it both as a, a, as a continuous and dichotomous variable. So that's helpful in, you know, how you would consider, um, you know, all sorts of different therapies for someone uh, who might be um, likely to have BCR in, in this particular population post-RP, how you might consider adjuvant radiation and with or without uh, testosterone suppression. Um, I think I'll just kind of skip through these for the purposes of time. I want to be respectful to everybody and, and, and really come to this is that the GPS assay can really help you with these patients too. It's, it's fabulous in the, the low risk and the favorable intermediate, but even some now of these unfavorable intermediate and high risk, it really comes down to treatment intensity. Whether you're going to go with radiation, a short course of ADT, or an extended course. And that's where this cut point of 40 was particularly helpful. We still debate this, you know, when do I start the, you know, the, the, the radiation? I think most would recommend that adjuvant clearly helps patients. Um, 
uh, rather than waiting to do um, um, salvage. But the other thing that's still debatable, and again, it's a it's an important patient physician shared discussion, is this notion around t androgen deprivation therapy, and then for how long? I think getting this GPS, especially when you're above 40, certainly would would tell you let's have that conversation uh, with the patient regarding T suppression, see how they tolerate it, and and whether or not you're you're going to go with a short or long course. We know that T suppression augments the the cell kill effect with radiation, both in primary cases and at, in an adjuvant setting. So um, here's a, a, a GPS case three, an NCCN patient who is unfavorable intermediate risk. Uh, you see the a three plus four, PSA 9.2, six out of 14 cores. Concerning pyrads, physician wants to do um, a focal therapy. Focal therapy, I know it's controversial for some, but it's clearly has been gaining traction. There are lots of different ways of doing it not really the focus of today's call, but let's assume the patient had uh, a, a, a localized to one low, but then you see this cut point of the GPS of 42. So this changed the discussion from going from focal therapy to total gland radiation therapy in six months of ADT. Now, some might've said, well, you know what, let's go to radical prostatectomy. Of course, you could certainly argue that, Maybe you'd do the radiation therapy in longer than six months of, of ADT. But the, the, the nice aspect here is by getting the GPS score, which is just sending the archival tissue that from your biopsy, you're giving additional stratification to your treatment decision-making. All right, I'm gonna skip this case. It's kind of parrots what I just said. But actually, it is kind of a cool case in a way. It's an older patient. He's 84. And they're like, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. You know, come on. It's only a grade group two, but the PSA is high. Only one out of eight cores. Yeah, I got to say, I sometimes do a lot. I do fewer cores on older patients. I want to cut down any risk of bleeding and discomfort. But bam, look what you find here when you do the GPS score. Um, he's got a, a high cut point. He's over 40. And so, and if he's got a good actuarial survival, I'm sure for many of you, there are days when I'm in my clinic where, you know, a young patient I'm seeing is in, is in their 70s. I'm seeing more and more patients in their 80s. And I used to, you know, blink them and say, wow, you're in your 80s. Now, now I see lots of patients in their 90s. We have better cardiovascular um, support, better nutrition, exercise, people are living longer. And this notion of nihilism for an 84 year old, um, you know, they can sometimes benefit. The, the, the biggest increase in can prostate cancer mortality is by each advancing decade. Um, so this is a good example of where you get this information and you can share this with the patient, his, his partner, his family. And I think that helps uh, for a better informed decision making, yeah, here's where you see the the numbers here with you know a seventy three percent likelihood of a BCR on if surgery were done, ten year risk, um, and so this is this could be the patient who who you can get living well into his mid nineties. So in summary, um, GPS. Um, Previously, and the, the other companies called it the Oncotype DX. I think the genomic prostate score, the GPS is really an ideal acronym and way to say it. The genomic prostate score gives you really meaningful, actionable information on the biology of the disease that is independent of clinical and histopathologic and even radiographic MRI findings. Um, for lower risk patients, it can really help in decision-making of surveillance versus immediate therapy with curative intent. And for higher risk patients, it can help, you know, ADT uh, 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 or not, as well as ADT with or without testosterone uh, suppression. So with that, it brings us back to the, you know, beginning slide. Um, you know, we can, you know, look, use these three platforms, the select MDX, the confirm MDX, and now the GPS score to help you 
uh, create a sort of a, a, a an algorithm, a pathway, a protocol in your clinic, uh, you know, uh, to help your diagnosing when to biopsy, uh, how to confirm the findings, and how to ultimately stratify for treatment decision making. So uh, with that, I think we're, you know, just a little bit under uh, our 90 minutes. So let me stop and thank everybody for, for tuning in. And I'm happy to answer any, any other questions.